Living Waters presents On the Box. Afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another edition of On the Box. We are blessed today to be joined by Kirk Cameron. Kirk, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. How are you? Good. It's been a few weeks since you've been with us. Anything new to report? Anything going on evangelistically, professionally? I still haven't managed to grow that mustache. It takes time. It For does. some, it takes time. You need, yeah. First, you need a great deal of olive oil in the skin. And that it comes is. with a little bit of Italian heritage. I don't know. You have any Italian? I have an Italian you? wife. You, well, so yeah, that, that makes you Italian by proxy, but yeah, yeah, I don't not know not if it not carries not the genetics with it. Yeah. God says the two shall become one. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Thank you for the like quote. The <laughs> <laughs> Any, anything going so on? Anything going on? Yeah. Uh, boy, let's see. I'm um, I'm I'm heading off to uh, Washington D.C. and uh, Gettysburg, Jamestown soon with my son and his eighth grade um, class on a field trip. And so we're going to go and really check out the heritage of our country, yeah. founding fathers. It's going to be fun. Have you ever been to Gettysburg? Uh, not to Gettysburg, no. I, I got to go there a couple of summers ago. Took the family to D.C. for family vacation and uh, it covered Father's Day. So my Father's Day gift was to get to go open air preach at Devil's Den in Gettysburg, which was pretty cool. Wow. Great place. Yeah, we, our family loves uh, Trace in American history, and I'm particularly fond of that era, Civil War era. So Yeah, yeah, it should be fun. I'm looking forward to yeah. it. All right, hey, today's but giveaway is In Six Days, edited by John Ashton, uh, another book donated to us by Master Books, a division of New Leaf Publications. Uh, if you would like to win that today, we're going to give away three copies. Just email us at onthebox at livingwaters.com, onthebox at livingwaters.com, full name, full address, please only enter once. And, uh, you know, the Hathaways is a family that watches the show all the time, and uh, they're trying to get around this rule of only entering once by oh having yeah. each and every family member enter. Enter once. And I, I'm pretty sure they have their dog entering, entering too. I can't well. confirm that, but, <laughs> uh, but we'll count that as, as one if the Hathaways each enter, enter one time. Um, we also want your uh, videos, your questions, your comments. We're going to be doing a segment today uh, here in just a couple of minutes in which we show a series of short clips from some witnessing we did recently at Cerritos College. And uh, we do want to hear back from you if you like these short chalk talk uh, clips from recent uh, witnessing encounters. So on the box at livingwaters.com. And as Chad always says, hang with us at onthebox.us, our blog. Danny, why are you shaking your head? It's a good blog. Oh, you're behind me? Okay. Chad, how are you doing today, buddy? I'm doing really good. Yeah, Kirk's on the show. I'm excited. <laughs> KC. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> What's happening, baby? <laughs> All right. Hey, let's get right to it. Uh, like I said, we've been uh, going to Cerritos College again. We've been talking about it for the last couple of days on the show. We have found favor there with the chief of police, which is a really good thing. And uh, getting into a lot of good conversations there. We've been going over there to work on uh, Ray's uh, Hitler uh, DVD documentary, getting clips for season five and for the show. And uh, we're run into some pretty interesting characters. A uh, lot of uh, moral relativism and, and that sort of thing, which is prevalent on college campuses. So what we're going to do today is we're going to show you a series of four or five clips. And then in, betwe in between each one, we're going to chalk talk it, uh, give our points of view, maybe give some tips for witnessing to people like this. So let's go to the first one. Who was Adolf Hitler? Adolf Hitler, well, he was a German. He was a lot of different things. He's he a good guy? Mm, I don't know. I don't really believe in good and evil, but I think he did a lot of things that the rest of the world was very not happy about, but he did what he really felt was right for his people, which in a way is a good thing. Why wouldn't you believe in good and evil? Most people say Adolf Hitler was evil. Uh, it's too cut and dry. There's, it's like never straight up and down. There's is no murder evil? Do you, I mean, that's a, and that's kind of a loaded question. Is killing Jews evil? Like I said, that's kind of a loaded question. Is killing blacks evil? Is killing whites evil? Well, I'm asking the questions. <laughs> that's my answer. Is pedophilia right or wrong? Mm, that one I would consider not cool. Yeah, I'm not asking but if it's I, cool. I don't, know if it's, I don't really... Is it wrong? Period. I don't have an answer for that. Kirk, I could see you shaking your head. Um, 
some initial thoughts on those first couple clips? What do you say to somebody like that? Um, I remember meeting someone who had just as uh, obnoxious of answers as, as that guy uh, on an airplane, and he told me that he didn't believe in good or bad or right or wrong, and in fact uh, couldn't come out and say that what Hitler did was evil or it was bad or it was wrong, uh, which was just, just a, tremendous, a, a, a tremendous feat to be able to suppress your own conscience and your knowledge of right and wrong and come out with things like that all for the sake of being able to uh, snuggle up next to your own little sin mm -hmm. and be able to tell everybody else to leave me alone because you can't tell me that there's right. something wrong with it. That's right. You know, <laughs> you mentioned suppressing the truth, and there was a couple of things this young man said uh, in answer to Ray's questions that made it real obvious that that's exactly what he was trying to do. He said uh, to one of Ray's questions, well, that's too cut and dry which is doublespeak for I don't really want to tell you what it is that I'm thinking in my heart. He knows it's wrong. He knows in his conscience it's wrong, but because of his pride, his love of sin, like you mentioned, he can't bring himself to it. And then answering Ray's questions with, well, that's a loaded question. That's another way of saying, I don't want to, I don't want to touch this. I don't want to answer this. Yeah. And you hear and that all the time. And, and, and saying, um, so you think it's so, how about pedophilia? Yeah. Uh, clearly, any, any, any decent human being would say, no, that that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. He says, well, no, that's not cool. <laughs> right. That, that was about as close as he wanted to get to that's wrong. Yeah. Or that's bad. It's not cool. Yeah. Chad, what do you think? These aren't loaded questions. No. I mean, they're pretty <laughs> straight questions. You know, is child molestation wrong? It's not loaded. Anybody should be able to come out and say, yes, child molestation is wrong. But this is what happens when he tries to be consistent with his mouth. It comes at a very high price. Uh, he relativizes everything. I don't even know if relativize. Is that really a word? It works Maybe. today. Sure. Yeah, but, um, to the know, point of being ridiculous. Uh, right and wrong to him, it's like a, a matter of opinion on what kind of ice cream do you like. Or you know, some people like broccoli. Some people don't like broccoli. It's all a matter of taste. Some people are child molesters. Others aren't. Nobody's more right than the other person. It's just a matter of taste. It's disgusting. And, you know, I don't think he lives his life this way. No, he If doesn't. you were to reach out and grab him by the neck, you know, you'd hear some words like, hey, you shouldn't mm -hmm. or you ought not or whatever. You know, he, just, he doesn't live this, his life this way. He just waxes eloquently with his mouth. Right. And doesn't do co too good a job of that. And, you know, working as a deputy sheriff, I never got a call to a victim's house who said to me, you know, I really don't want to take a report because that person, you know, it was right for them to burglarize my home. I, it was okay for them to break into my car. It was yeah. okay for them to rape my wife. It was. They wrong. don't live their life that way. It wasn't wasn't wrong for them to uh, steal the money. Right. I'm not going to say it was wrong for them to murder that person, but I just didn't like it, and so I'm hoping you'll go arrest them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, were you victimized today? Well, that's kind of a loaded question. No one answers that way. You know, would you <laughs> like me to take a report? Well, that's kind of a loaded question. Right. The real issue is they don't like the rulings of the law. Right. And they don't want someone else telling them uh, what that standard of right and wrong is. Exactly. Uh, none of us really do. Until you come to the point of realizing that the standard's been written on our heart by the creator of the universe. Once that resonates as true uh, and, you, and you submit to the rightful authority uh, over the earth, then you come to understand... Uh, that that this is this is a good thing yeah. to understand the law and to understand that he's also merciful through Christ uh, is is everything. Yeah, it's real peculiar how this sort of moral relativism has masqueraded as itself as like the sort of intellectual superiority. <laughs> like this is real rational. You know how rational is that? You know, real free thinker here. You know to say I, I can't say that child molestation is you know really wrong. It's not cool. That's not rational. That's bizarre. You yeah. know, so. Now, you know, we're, we're picking on this kid a little bit, but the gospel was shared with him that day, and our primary purpose for being out there on the campus anywhere else we go is not to get video footage, but to proclaim the gospel to the lost. So while we're tearing this kid's worldview apart, you know, our heart goes out to him. We want him to come to repentance and faith in Christ. And before we go to the next clip, I want to ask the unbelievers who may be watching out there, uh, hearing what this kid is saying, would you want him to build your house? Would you want him to be your surgeon operating on you for cancer? Would you want him to be the police officer who responds to your home in an emergency with his way of thinking? Something to think about as we watch this next clip. So your name was again? Ben. 
Ben, okay. Ben, my name's Chad. So, Ben, you don't believe in right and wrong? No. And why is that? It's purely subjective. I mean, it's never really straight up and down, if that makes any sense. That's kind of the best way I can explain it. So when you think of something like torturing babies for the fun of it, you can't say that's black and white wrong? You, you say I that say it's, 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 it's open? I say it's cruel. But I mean, like, torturing babies for the fun of it, you should be stopped. I don't believe in right or wrong, but I would stop you if I saw you doing it. Okay. I don't think you'd go to hell if you did it, though, because, I mean, even if you did go to hell, you can find heaven in hell. When you use a word like should or ought, are you not assuming that there's a certain way that things should or ought to be? Hmm. In my own personal ideals? I've, I have an ideal world, but I believe that other people disagree with me about what my ideal world is, and they could be just as right as I am. I think you could be just as right as I am. So you think that each individual person has their own truth value, and it's equivalent to one another? I have my opinion, you have your opinion, and neither one of us has any more truth value than the other? Essentially. Just yes or no? Yes. So your truth value, your opinion, has no more weight or bearing than a child molester's or a rapist? They still believe what they believe, you know? Like, think about it. How many rapists were priests? Uh, the question was, though, you believe by your standard that their moral opinion is just as valuable, not any less valuable, than yours. It has just as much weight. Yeah, they're still human beings. Everybody has their... Everybody has their right to have their moral opinion. Now, the rest of the human race and the rest of the world, maybe even the rest of the universe and nature itself, may try to stop that because it's something that goes against, you know, how do I word this, the well-being of everything around it. But I still think they're entitled to do that. Just like, and I, they're going to tape this, and I'm probably going to regret saying this, but I have to, just like I think Hitler's entitled to do what he did, but I still would have fought against him. Why would you fight against him? I don't agree with the taking, just, I don't believe in genocide. It's too, it's like, it's just like, you know, the right versus wrong. It's like saying, because you are you, you're wrong. Okay. And just kind of going back on what you're saying though, that's only your opinion, mm -hmm. and your opinion ultimately has no more value than a child molester's or a rapist. Pretty much. Isn't there something within you that just kind of screams, this is just wrong, but I can't explain it from my worldview? Isn't there something within you that just says raping and child molesting isn't only subjectively wrong, it's not just wrong because that's my opinion, but it's absolutely wrong, but with my worldview, I just can't explain that somehow. Is that sort of the conundrum that you're in? Hmm. Something along those lines. That's what happens when you give up belief in God, when you suppress the truth. Kirk, you picked up on something uh, pretty important there in that video. Yeah, I think it's pretty ob obvious to see that um, eventually when you get boxed into a corner with that kind of a worldview, you're going to end up saying things like, well, um, doing that is too this or you 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 should not be allowed to do that or that ought to be stopped um it kind of comes down to a right and wrong thing which is the very premise that he rejected in the very beginning so you know i these kind of clips i think are very helpful because it just shows you where the that kind of a worldview leads you it leads you to to making preposterous statements and things that you wouldn't want to live out in the real world chad what are your thoughts you talked to this kid. What was, what was your take on this kid? I mean, I, I feel like it was all there in, in the clip. It's it like, like Kirk says, as soon as you hear a word like should or ought, when you're talking to somebody that claims that there really are no absolutes, uh, you need to grab onto that like a, like a pit bulldog because when they use a word like should or ought, they're assuming there's a way that things should be or ought to be. And it's a lot like uh, C.S. Lewis points out in Mere Christianity. Yep. Uh, in order I'm for you to point to out that. that something is crooked, you got to know what straight is. So if somebody says things should be a certain way, they're assuming there is a way that things are supposed to be. But a little bit ago, 
He says there are no absolutes. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion and their truth value has the same bearing, the same weight as, as anybody else. So you don't ever really have any progress with a worldview like that. All you have is moral change, but no progress. There's no direction uh, that things are going in. So again, it just kind of comes down to a fashion. You know, what Hitler did at one point in time uh, in society, if you're a moral relativist, it was very fashionable. It was cool, it was hip, it was the right thing to do. Uh, at this point in time, uh, we live in a, in a place where it's not so fashionable. But who knows, that fashion might come around again. Right now, it's just not. People don't like that type of clothing. Yeah. You know, uh, after you've spent a little time out on the streets talking to people one-to-one, you begin to develop uh, the ability to read people. You know, you, you start to develop the ability to, to know when someone's lying to you or when they're holding back or, mm. you know, when they're trying to get you on a rabbit trail. I, you just pick up that sense over time. And, and there were several cues with this kid uh, that made it very telling. One, he was doing a lot of laughing and snickering. There was nothing funny about the questions. Uh, there was no joking going on. That kid was laughing at what was coming out of his mouth. He knew that what he was saying was ridiculous. That's and when right. Chad really started to pin him down towards the end, notice how short his answers got. I mean, at one time, he almost squeaked out the word, nope, you know, because <laughs> he couldn't believe that the words were coming out of his mouth because he knew he was trapped. And then that last long pregnant pause, that was like the aha moment. You know, Chad, Chad had him dead to rights. He knew that his worldview was all out of whack. And when you get a person to that point, that's when you start to bring the law and the gospel to them. Because they know that their way of thinking is is wrong. So, yeah, I, I've, Chad, I, I, you did a great job talking to him. You know, you you, you weren't condescending. No, you not were at just all. you were just leading him uh, down the road of his worldview and coming to coming to the uh, to the end of the road mm -hmm. and saying, w w "What does this look like?" And he made these preposterous statements that you know what Hitler did uh, was right for him, and so we can't really say that that was wrong. How 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 foolish and horrible is that i think it's important to watch these kind of clips over and over not only to um help you understand the silliness of these types of worldviews, but then also how to respond to people yeah. when you're out there on the streets witnessing to them so that you can learn how to grab onto those words like ought and should or it's to that or or um those kinds of things and uh and then take them to the end of the road of their worldview, and then like you said, Tony, to be able to share the gospel with them biblically. Don't stop there and okay. say, see, so you're crazy, you don't make sense. Say, the way you're thinking leads you to these things that you know you, you don't wanna live out and that don't make sense. Um, my view, on the other hand, I is a view that does make sense and that you would wanna live out, but what you need to understand is that you need a savior, and here's why. And you bring out the law. Right. And, you know, Chad talking to that young man, you couldn't have two people further apart in their thinking, but yet there was no weeping or gnashing of teeth. You know, there, were, there was no cursing of each other. There was no yelling and screaming. It was a very reasoned conversation between two people who had never met. And anybody can do that. Anybody can do that. You just need to love God and love people more than you love yourself in and more than you fear man. Chad, do you have something? Yeah, the way that ended was uh, Ray was actually able to share the, the gospel with him just before I had that conversation, and uh, I ended up shaking his hand, and he ended up giving Ray a big fat hug. There you go. Ray so gets <laughs> hugs all the time. He hugs all he the does. time. Yeah. yeah. All right. Hey, we got two more clips we want to show you. Uh, these two uh, we filmed just yesterday. We're out at the campus of Cerritos College again. I had the opportunity to have a conversation with a young man named Theo. We probably spent, I don't know, 15 or 20 minutes together. It was a good conversation. Uh, but uh, we want to share with you just a couple of snapshots of that conversation and then talk about it. Let's look at the first one. So let's look at lying a little closer. If I lied to a small child, there's probably nothing that child can do to me, right? It would be wrong, yeah. but I'm not going to be punished. If I go home tonight and I lie to my wife, I might end up sleeping on the couch. Yeah? yeah. Uh, come here to school, uh, cheat, lie on an exam, I could get kicked out of class or even school. Yeah. Go to work, lie to my boss, I could lose my job. Uh, stand before a judge in a courtroom, lie to him, I could end up going to prison. It's still just a lie, but what's changed is who the offense is against. Follow me? God is infinitely holy and just, and so therefore any sin to God is infinitely sinful, no matter how small we've made it in our own mind. That's why the Bible is true when it says all liars will have their part in a lake of fire. Have you ever heard that? No, it's pretty intense though. It is, it is. So with all of that in mind, you still think heaven's where you're gonna go? 
Yeah, I do actually. Really? And and again, that's based on what? My just my beliefs. Again, that young man's name was Theo. Now, that analogy that I shared with him, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. I don't think I've ever had an original thought. Uh, the first time I ever heard that used was by our mutual friend Cameron Butel when right. I took him out to Cerritos College. I heard him do that with a group of kids, and I said, wow, that, that's, that's powerful. I'm going to start using that. And, uh, you know, the reason I did that is because uh, Theo was a person that, un not unlike many people we talk to, who minimize the sins they like. Right. You know, the, the things that they admit they're guilty of aren't that big a deal. And so I used that analogy to show him that it didn't matter what he thought of the sin, but what God thought of the sin. Yeah, I, I think that's really good. I've, I've uh, found that really helpful for me, even as a Christian, in my understanding of sin. I'm sorry, of hell. When you think of eternal, divine wrath, th that is a concept that is just so mind-blowing. It's... It's hard to fit into your own mind. It's hard to stomach the concept of it. Um, but what helps me as a Christian is to understand that the severity of the punishment is in direct relation to the one against whom you're doing, uh, right. you're committing the crime. And I think it's really helpful to be able to share that with um, non-Christians also. Yeah, an analogy like that helps the person to take uh, the camera lens off themselves and look at their sin through the mirror of God's law and try to give them a perspective of how God sees their sin, who's ultimately right. going to be the one who judges them for that. So, Chad, what right. do you think of that? Yeah, I kind of like what Ray points out, too, to folks when they, you know, they, they don't see sin so bad in their, their own eyes. He'll say, you know, you know what your problem is, is your moral standard is very low. Mm -hmm. It doesn't measure up to God's. And what matters the most is what is God's moral standard, because that's what you're ultimately going to be judged by. And uh, like you said, nothing new under the sun. I've heard it. I think maybe Ray uh, was using this or Scotty was using this, this on the box one time in Huntington Beach. And uh, I would really take hold of this, you folks out there. I mean, you can think of a different variation of it because it really does help uh, to get that person that you're talking to to understand just the severity of how bad lying or stealing or these things are. I use one where if I say, if I kick the dog, people might frown at me. If I kick a bum... People are probably going to look the other way. If I kick a guy in the street, you know, I could get in trouble. If I kick a cop, he will arrest me if he can catch me. If I throw a flying kick at Obama, probably going to get a bullet put through my head. What changed? It's the same exact crime. It wasn't that big of a deal when it was against a little dog in the street. But when it was against Obama, I got a bullet put through my head. So the same crime, but it was the intensity went up when you consider the one you committed against. So a little lie to you and me, no big deal. But to the holy, eternal, just God, all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. We don't stop there, though. The good news, he provides a way out. <laughs> Amen. All right, this last clip, because uh, we want to be able to spend some time uh, going to the chat room. We were going to cover a news story uh, today, but the show is just, we've spent so much time on these good video clips that we're just going to cover that tomorrow. Okay. Um, but this last clip, have you ever had someone that you're talking to sharing the gospel with say, I don't believe that? Uh, well, I believe that there is no such place as hell. I believe that everybody's going to heaven. This is how I answered that kind of objection. So with all of that in mind, you still think heaven's where you're going to go? Yeah, I do actually. Really? And, and again, that's based on what? My, just my beliefs. Strong beliefs. Theo, what do you think is more important? What we believe or whether or not what we believe is true? What we believe. Okay. So Theo, Chris and I walked up to you to do this interview. Chris, who's behind the camera. And if I walked up to you and I said, hi, my name's Tony and this is my wife, Christina. I believe that my buddy there behind the camera is a woman. I wouldn't believe it. Well, w if, it, if what is important is what I believe, then shouldn't that be all right? Yeah, but that's you. It's me, I believe something else, so I'm not going to believe that he's a woman. So, but isn't what more, in that case, isn't what, what's more important is what's true? The truth is, Chris is not a woman. It, yeah, that's right? true. So in that sense, it doesn't matter what I believe. What matters is whether or not what I believe is true. Right? You could stand before a judge in a courtroom and the judge can find you guilty and you could say, Your Honor, I don't believe you're a judge. I don't believe I'm guilty and I don't believe I'm going to jail. How close to the doors of the courtroom do you get before you're tackled and carted off to prison? Jeez. Oh, <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter what yeah. you believe about the judge. What matters is what the judge believes about you. And because God is good, because he's holy and just, if he finds you guilty of breaking his law, you'll receive the just punishment for that sin, and that's eternity in hell. Would that concern you at all? A little, yeah. yeah. It would.
Now, ultimately, in the end of that conversation, it, it went well you know, throughout. Um, Chris was, or Theo rather, was still holding on to this idea that he was going to go to heaven because he was good. You know, he he just didn't get it. And you know, that's an example of the fact that we don't change hearts. God does. When God wants that young man to repent and believe, if he is going to, you know, salvation is of the Lord. It's it's not of us. But we proclaim it in spirit and in truth. Anyways, but you could see in that video, he was getting it. He understood uh, through that little uh, play on words that truth is more important than what we believe. Yeah, yeah, a absolutely. And, um, you know, I think it's important to have in the back of your mind also that, that sometimes there are people who don't believe in God because they've sort of been programmed to think a certain way by their science teacher, by their math yeah. teacher, by their parents, or by their friends. And they think the only intelligent answer is for me to say, uh, all that matters is what I believe. But if you can help him dismantle that, you may open the door for him to say, you know what, that makes perfect sense. And I do deep down agree with you. I just thought it was unintelligent to say that. But, but you really helped me make that make sense. And now I can walk through this door and begin investigating the claims of the gospel. Yeah. Chad, any uh, quick thoughts before we go to the chat room? Yeah, I was just really shocked when you asked him, what do you think is most important? What is true or what you believe? And he responds with what you believe. Well, and most people do. Yeah. Most people respond with that answer that I talked to. So, I mean, the follow-up question mm. there is, is, does that really work for you in reality? I mean, if a doctor told you, uh, you have cancer, do you say, well, that's true for you, doctor, but luckily, I believe I don't. It doesn't play out that way. Or the bank teller, the bank teller says, I'm sorry, but you're bankrupt. Well, that's what you believe, but I think I have $5,000 in there. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't matter how many people you get together and, you know, like Care Bears hug each other and say, let's just <laughs> believe the world is flat. I mean, at one time, there was a majority of people that believed the world was flat, but the truth was the world is round. So truth never changes. The truth yeah. always was the world is round, but belief does change. And what our goal is, is to line up belief with truth. There you go. That's the key. Yeah. All right. Hey, before we take a I'll quick say. question or two from the chat room, let's uh, get Ooh. the winners for today's uh, drawing. Yeah, winner number one, Isaac Salapat, two, Erica Teeple, and three, Corbett Finley. All right, yep. the three of you won uh, In Six Days, edited by John Ashton from Master Books, uh, Division of New Leaf Publication. We'll be getting that in the mail to you today. And again, if you like the segment that we just did, uh, we took most of the show to do it, but if you like the segment on Chalk Talking, these short clips, please email us and let us know at onthebox@livingwaters.com. We ultimately want to produce a show that is going to be most edifying and encouraging to you, our, our viewing audience. So with that, let's see if we can get at least one question out of the chat room. Yeah, someone here, they, they put, uh, Kirk, you and everyone at Living Waters team need to make an audio Bible. I don't know if you guys are working on an audio Bible, but I know you guys are working on some type of audio book right now, right, Kirk? You guys are just in the... Uh yeah, Ray and I are working on uh, the School of Biblical Evangelism. It's a textbook, 101 lessons on how to share the gospel biblically, and so we're turning that into an audio lesson CD so that you can listen to that. But, um, boy, there's so many good audio Bibles out there. there. Uh, you know, um, I admit it'd be fun to hear Ray and his uh, New Zealand accent uh, okay, reading so through the Bible. But Who would Ray play? Who, who would Ray play? Yeah, well, you're, you're a professional actor, Ray's voice. What character in the Bible do you think... Ray would be. Well, <laughs> Judas, of course. Oh! <laughs> oh! <laughs> you heard it here first, and maybe last. <laughs> wow. Doesn't R Ray mean devious one? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that Latin for devious one? Wow, there's the sound, sound bite of the show. Wow, and I'd probably get type, typecast as one of the centurions, but that's, that's okay. <laughs> what about Chad? Who Navy would Chad Seal? be? Yeah, who would Chad be? You're really throwing Kirk under the bus here, aren't you? Boy. Well, that, I don't know who got thrown <laughs> out of the bus, if it was Kirk or Ray. It's yeah, Judas. I, I, I sort of threw Ray <laughs> under the bus. <laughs> Put him on the spot. <laughs> yeah, took him off the box All and right. threw him under All the right, bus. We'll, we'll let that one go. We got one more. Um, uh, a question about the cross. Tony, where did you get your cross? Oh, you carry around? okay. Well, that's, uh, uh, that was actually a cross that was in the... the uh, You're talking about your big cross. Yeah, the cross that I carry from time to time uh, out on the streets. Uh, a young man made it for me when I was pastoring a church plant in uh, Santa Clarita. We were using a homeowner association clubhouse uh, as our church sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And once the doors of the church plant closed, that cross hung on the wall for about six or seven years. And I got the wild idea one day to stencil the words, are you ready on it? And go stand on the street corner uh, with it. And I'm thinking the whole time I'm out there, I said, oh, man, the, you know, 
one of the deputies I worked with for years are going to come by and say, Tony, you finally you snapped. You finally lost it. It finally happened. You know, you're a couple sandwiches short of a lunchbox now, Tony. Um, but the Lord has used it. And uh, I've been able to get in wonderful conversations around my community because of those simple words. Are you ready? What does that mean? And so, yeah, that's how that, that's how that came about. It's not for everybody. You know, we're certainly not saying here at Living Waters, hey, everybody go out and, and uh, hold a sign or make a cross. You know, we want you to do evangelism based on the personality and uh, gifts and talents that God has given you so long as you're proclaiming the gospel in a biblical way. So, all right, with that, we're about out of time. Uh, we want to thank you for joining us for another edition on the, of On the Box, Kirk. Thank you so much for being with us Thanks today. for having me on it's again. It's been great. Uh, and so until tomorrow morning, 1130 a.m. Pacific time right here on this channel, be encouraged, strengthened, and unafraid. Proclaim the gospel. Living Waters presents On the Box.